Hello, distinguished guests, partners, supporters, and friends. Welcome to the Computer History Museum 2021 Fellow Awards. I'm Marguerite Gong Hancock, Vice President of Innovation here at CHM. It's wonderful to have each of you here for this special backstage event. Since 1987, the CHM Fellow Awards have honored remarkable pioneers in computing. A special welcome to all of our fellows from over the years who have joined us this evening. We're excited to kick off this evening with an insider event with all of you. Now, here is CHM President and CEO, Dana Lewin. Thank you, Marguerite. It's wonderful to see everyone backstage at our virtual CHM Fellow Awards. I've seen a lot of familiar faces and supporters, and I'm also excited to see new and welcome many new partners. I'm joining you live from our virtual stage in Mountain View, California. Thank you all for being here tonight. I'm so grateful to our CHM community, our core donors, trustees, staff, and volunteers who advance our mission every day with their passion and support. We're really thrilled to honor 2021 fellow Ray Ozzie. Welcome, Ray. Thank you, Daniel. It's great to be here. You know, I, I, I really appreciate uh, what you've done to put this together. I, I cannot believe how much work uh, this, this has been for the people who are on staff. Thanks, Marguerite. Thanks, um, thanks to everyone. Uh, it, was a, it was a lot of fun doing the oral history, and um, uh, I look forward to tonight. Now, we are too. Hi, Ray. Hi. You know, I want to start by remembering when we met in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I was at Next, we had just started the company, yeah. and you just formed Iris Associates. Mm -hmm. And you were beginning to design what would become Lotus Notes. Um, and then we connected again after you started Groove, which was a really exciting moment in your life and in general. And then you came to Microsoft, where I'd been for a few years. And then who would imagine that here we are 20 years later, sitting in down and having this conversation uh, on this very special occasion. Yep. So the theme for tonight's program are inspired by your life's work and impact. They are build and tech for collaboration. So as we begin, I wanna ask a question of you. How did you discover your passion for technology, for collaboration and communication? And since you've worked on so many products and companies in this rapidly changing industry and the different business environments, can you tell us a little bit more about the way you think about change? Great questions. Um, the story of how I uh, uh, got a passion for communication collaboration is probably longer than, than we have time for. The, um, I was very fortunate that in, in college we were, um, I got exposed to a system called Plato, which I know people at the Computer Museum are very familiar with, but it's not uh, generally broadly known. Um, uh, but in, in the late 60s and early and mid 70s, um, those of us who had exposure to this system, which was a computer-based teaching system, um, got a chance to see, uh, get a little peek of what the internet would become with respect to online uh, gaming, online discussion, online community, collaboration, and so on. Um, I had a particularly impactful moment because I was a developer working on a project and um, was assigned to work for someone remotely, which was not all that unusual on that system, completed the project. And uh, the guy was a very lousy typist, very eloquent in his emails, but very lousy in chat. Um, and after the project was over, I went to his uh, home for a party and I was kind of shocked because um, this gentleman uh, was a quadriplegic uh, and the reason he typed so badly was he had a stick in his mouth. Uh -huh. And um, uh, it just, it's one of those things that, um, oh, you didn't know, you didn't know. Um, but it left this indelible impression on me that what we were doing, communicating using the computer as a communication tool, um, uh, there was something special about it that could get past, um, uh, that was different and, and, and in a way, uh, some ways worse, some ways better um, than interacting face to face. And here we are um, <laughs> doing it in a completely different way. Yeah, in terms amazing. of change, um, yeah. uh, um, you know, the, the, the industry has many technologies that, that progressively move along and what I, and I think a number of, uh, of other leaders in the industry do is to kind of try to map out 
where these things are going, overlay them in the future, and then pick a, pick a future time, five years, eight years, and sort of say, if there wasn't an evolution of technology that got there, if technology began that day, what would the world look like? Because what try, tends to make people not think that broadly is that they're thinking in incremental terms. But if you can dream what something will be like at an endpoint um, in the future, as though that were the first day with those technologies, I think your brain goes into a different, a different mode. Yeah, that's fantastic. Let's take a look back now at your roots. Uh, I think you were employee number 29 at Software Arts. Um, it may have been one of your first quote unquote real jobs. You were working on breakthrough products at the time, a little computer program uh, for spreadsheets known as VisiCalc. And then uh, you had your experience working on TK Solver. So what was your experience like at Software Arts? You know, this was, this was the first time I, I worked for someone else's startup. Um, you know, I had done a little startup in college, uh, um, uh, but, but this was an amazing experience for me. Uh, Dan and Bob, uh, Dan Brooklyn and Bob Frankson, who uh, founded the startup and wrote VisiCalc, um, uh, were brilliant, but one of the things that was amazing is they ran the 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 uh, the company um, as a family. It just felt as though everyone cared about each other. There was no infighting. We were all on the same page, all going the same direction. And it had some of the downsides also. You felt when things were great, we all celebrated. When Dan and Bob uh, felt a little pain because of maybe the relationship with uh, our publisher, or something, we all you know, felt it also. Um, but again, it, it, it was just a, a wonder, wonderful place. And Dan and, uh, Dan and Bob um, also were very generous in introductions and stuff. It was during that era that I met Bill Gates and Paul Allen because we dealt with MS-DOS. You know, Gary Kildall, you know, Steve Jobs and his team, you know, Mike Boich, Joanna Hoffman, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, Andy. Um, it was just a it was it was just a wonderful experience, and the industry was very small at the time, sure. um, so it was just a very positive positive experience. Yeah, well, we've got a message for you right now from the Software Arts co-founder and Alpha Corporation CTO, also a CHM fellow, Dan Bricklin. Thanks, Daniel. Hey, Ray. As a fellow, it's so good to have you joining the group. I was talking to Bob Frankston the other day about it, and he remembered interviewing you for Software Arts back in the early 1980s. He asked you something about remote procedure calls to watch your thought process. Little do you know, the remote coordination was a major part of your DNA as the next 40 years have shown. Of course, you passed the interview and the two of you became quite a pair of techies. You went from the huge network of Plato to many computers at Data General to the new IBM PC with us. Here you are, obviously a star programmer, but you worked diligently implementing the IBM PC version of the bytecode interpreter for our high level implementation language. Nothing flashy to show off to your friends and family like the user interface, but it was a solid foundation that was key to us delivering our products. Now, for the rest of you, here's something I've come to realize about Ray. He gets into the messy details without compromise. When he encounters hard problems, he solves the hard problems instead of taking a watered down, simpler approach that doesn't scale. I've seen that over and over again. Building a solid foundation is what he does. When he built what became Lotus Notes in the late 1980s, it was asynchronous distributed computing, and it had public key encryption and very high level security built in as part of the design. It wasn't just a simple proof of concept, but a robust enterprise grade system. And he did an innovative business deal with Lotus to ensure that it happened. In the early 1990s at Slate Corporation, we used notes to run a distributed company. And it was so great to even do work in an airplane with no connectivity. And you just sync up when you got to a LAN connection on the ground. To this day, some new feature will show up in a product and be touted as a breakthrough. And invariably, you'll hear from an old timer, well, Notes had that. Ray is driven to not only build things, but also to build a complete shipping product and a company or organization around it. Ray has also been a major catalyst for the Massachusetts technology community. While at IBM Lotus, 
he worked hard to engage IBM's R&D groups with the Massachusetts development community. IBM hadn't previously had much of a development presence here. At Microsoft, working with others, he helped to do the same, resulting in the beloved Microsoft New England R&D Center in the heart of Cambridge's Kendall Square, the Microsoft Nerd Center. Finally, an observation of mine. When we came out with new software like the spreadsheet, we had to get new users to buy hardware they didn't already have. Even when I started writing early iPad software, I had to buy my testers and designers hardware. This was a major impediment to adoption. The success of Notes resulted in the installation of thousands and thousands of PCs connected to LANs that were actually used daily by management, and they were on many desks and many large corporations. Starting to use the web and intranets was merely just adding some new software. The, so the hardware was already on the desk, the wires were in the walls, and the high-speed telco lines were connected. The users already knew being connected online was good. I see notes as a catalyst to the rapid adoption of the web and internet as we know it. Congratulations on a well-deserved honor, Ray. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Ray, anything you'd like to add about those days and your time with Dan? Oh, they were just terrific. I mean, I, you know, sometimes um, you can plan things. I was very fortunate to have been born at a, at a time when this industry, uh, uh, you know, was taking off. And uh, I've met a lot of, I've been, I've been able to be uh, mentored by a number of just amazing people. And Dan and Bob were two of the, two, they're, they're one of a kind, but there are two of them. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but something. tremendous. Yeah, what a, what a lucky moment. So let's shift gears for a moment and talk about your passion for building teams and organizations and companies. I think Dan referenced that quite well. Can you talk a little bit about your role as an entrepreneur or a company builder? Uh, and SafeCast and Groove Networks come to mind. I'm not sure people know too much about SafeCast, but I'd like you to give us a little update on your thinking about those organizations. You know, um, most everything I have done um, in my career, I have worked for commercial enterprises, and and you know one, the uh, the largest startup that I did but, um, that was independent of of, of a, a large company was Groove. Groove was a a great learning experience for me. It was the first time I had to um, uh, build not just the technology but the go to market. Unlike in the Lotus situation where they did the go to market, this was a, a huge learning experience for me. Um, the product was wonderful. We did not uh, have a commercial success. Ultimately, um, Microsoft ended up buying it and uh, used the technologies for SharePoint, um, and that's great. And all the the uh, the people um, uh, went to Microsoft, and it, and that was great. But um, uh, what differentiates Safecast? Not not many people probably know about it, but. Uh, um, uh, 10 years ago, there was a tsunami in uh, Japan and uh, there were meltdowns as a, a side effect of that tsunami. And um, a number of tech people and non-tech people uh, just who knew each other just wanted to know what we could do to help. And so uh, we met out there and uh, essentially what we decided was that uh, the biggest thing that we could do is uh, measure and open data. Uh, uh, so we built um, using standard IoT technologies, um, uh, what Chris Anderson would, you know, call the the peace dividend of the smartphone wars. You know, you right. could just uh, uh, and we put, uh, assembled these things, went out through the exclusion zone, um, measured radiation, and published it. And here we are, ten years later. It's probably the world's largest open uh, citizen science data set. Um, radiation now moving into air monitoring. Um, I'm a director of that, uh, uh, that volunteer organization. Um, and uh, my, my new company um, is not in the uh, citizen science world. We, we are building, um, it's Blues Wireless. We're building um, infrastructure as a service, little, uh, uh, little devices that if, if an, a manufacturer embeds it in their product, um, you can uh, disseminate that product uh, worldwide to your customers and get uh, transparent feedback about what problems the customers are having with it or how you might be able to serve them better. But SafeCast is using it for um, air quality monitoring and we're, we have uh, created a, a, a version of that. It's a cellular module that um, 
uh, has all of the cellular uh, uh, that you need embedded in it so you don't have to get a subscription. And uh, they made an air quality monitor that you can put on the outside of your uh, window and that's all you have to do. It reports and, and shows, uh, shows you, uh, you know, what the air quality is like on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm just very excited about it. Um, yeah, it sounds, it's fantastic. Let's talk a little bit about that transition um, from building companies to landing at that little company known as Microsoft. I mean, moving from your nonprofit world to the to the for-profit world. So, how did that come about uh, with Groove? I obviously had met you when you had started the company, and yeah. I was working with the venture community. But um, then you know, I'd been there for a few years, and and then one day you showed up. So, how did that happen? <laughs> Tell us that story. Yeah, what, Groove was was a great product. Um, uh, uh, those who were there, this was the Napster uh, time, uh, you know, in, in the evolution of the internet. Um, it wasn't as clear at that point in time that centralized systems were going to be the things that took over and certain things that we just take for granted right now, like sharing your contact information, uh, you know, on a central service or a company putting all of its customer records and CRM into some other company's system uh, on the internet. Um, Though that was, it, was, it wasn't as obvious that that was going to be the direction. And so what we did was, um, I believe in, collabor in innovation and collaboration, we built a small team collaboration system mm -hmm. that was built on technologies that are very similar to a blockchain. It was a distributed, a system for distributed consensus among devices without servers. And uh, it was a, wonder, a wonderful little system. And it was particularly embraced by the public sector, both nonprofits and um, uh, you know, NGOs and government organizations responding to disasters and so on. But we had 250 employees and we took a lot of capital, $140 million of capital, and it wasn't on a path to being a unicorn. So uh, Microsoft, who was one of our investors, um, uh, bought the company, uh, gave everybody jobs, and um, I ended up uh, uh, splitting my time between uh, Seattle and, and, and Boston with my wife and uh, became one of Microsoft's uh, CTOs. Um, eventually, some months later, Bill uh, let us know of his potential plans of going off to uh, uh, work on the foundation with Melinda. And so he asked Craig Mundy and I to more or less split his role. I took the chief software architect role, which is more of an inwardly facing transformation and change role. Um, uh, Craig took the outward facing uh, role, sort of ministerial duties all around the world, um, uh, that part of what uh, Bill did. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm indebted for that opportunity because um, it was um, it was the first time I had been selling systems to companies to orchestrate their own change management, mm -hmm. um, uh, becoming distributed companies, and so on. Right. And this gave me an opportunity to understand uh, what change management was was really all about. Yeah, it was an incredible time. And for those who don't know, Ray wrote a memo uh, on the way into the company, and then five plus years, roughly later, when he left, that sort of summarized his worldview on the internet and the state of services at the time. And by the way, you mentioned Craig, I think Craig's here tonight uh, oh, in the program. So you'll get to say hello to him. Now <laughs> let's move on and now hear some stories from one of your colleagues uh, at Microsoft, uh, who's now the corporate vice president over AI and research. And that's Lily Chang. Let's hear from Lily. That's great. Thanks, Daniel. Congratulations, Ray. Um, I thought I'd share with you all a few stories about Ray. Um, one story actually started right here in the Computer History Museum. In 2010, we were here for the 50th anniversary of Plato. So, you know, that was a long time ago. And I remember we were listening to Don Bitzer up on stage talking about Plato and Ray kind of poked me in the arm and he said, you know, this is where it all began. It was the first collaboration software, the first network computers, so many first, the first, you know, they built these games that people could play, multiplayer games, education software, first bulletin boards where students were talking. And of course, that was also very controversial because students talking in the University of Illinois for a government funded project during Watergate meant that Don Bitzer's funding, um, you know, he was really, um, 
building something that was new that was very, very controversial with the government. So he was shielding his team from, you know, a lot of criticism that he was getting. And, you know, that was new information for Ray at the time. So I just love how Ray um, always honors that history and was amazed that he was really there, you know, in the very beginning of so many parts. You know, my second story is really our time together, which uh, we spent a lot of time working when Ray was at Microsoft. And I'm just so grateful. I can't imagine Microsoft without our cloud, Microsoft Azure, and the big workloads um, that helped companies bring all their software to the cloud, you know, Office 365, all of your communications. And again, this was like an idea that seems so obvious and Ray is always so great at looking at the big picture and the foundation and just going for the center. And sometimes the biggest innovations are those things in the center that so many people don't do because they think someone else is doing it or it might be too challenging or might be too difficult. And um, I'm just grateful for what you did for you know, Microsoft and how much that changed the culture and you know, all the products um, and customers and just how much I learned doing that. And maybe my last story is something you know, very personal. I used to um, really love the early internet culture, which I still do. But it was, you know, at the time people thought it was crazy people building social software, talking about ham sandwiches and their cats. And they weren't serious computer scientists. You know, they were kind of slackers. And so I loved these people and I uh, probably was one of them. And we built a conference around people in academia who were information scientists, bloggers, and also a lot of the early startups. And I invited Ray. It was, he had just started at Microsoft and I wasn't sure if he was gonna come because he was really busy. And um, I was just so touched that he showed up. He showed up early, sat in the back, had this big smile on his face and, um, you know, everyone was just so amazed that this, you know, figure, this person that we had really learned so much from was just sitting there hanging out. And we were trying to get him to give a talk. And he was like, no, 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 I don't want to give a talk. So people just sort of picked up their chairs because they're very outgoing and they like circled him and just kind of did a spontaneous vote with your feet. And it was just perfect. And I think that it's not a surprise or you know, just an odd coincidence that Ray, given his character, his willingness to listen and the way he builds teams and the way he builds products and um, thinks about communication and lives communication, it's not a surprise that, you know, you're really um, innovated so much because I think that character and that spirit is so obvious in every product that you built and really shaped so much collaboration that, you know, we've just come to um, believe as you know obvious and given today out in the world so thank you so much for how much you taught me and thank you so much just for you know everything you've done um, thanks thank wow. you lily yeah lily thank you what what a testament that's um that was great so well said and and, and perfect ray anything you'd like to add based upon your time or in response to lily's comments no, just, just I, you know, one of the most wonderful things that I never really understood when I got into this business at the, uh, you know, at the beginning was, I'm a technologist and I would focus on technology, but the people um, are just incredible. The people that you learn from, the people that you're exposed to, you have the opportunity to pay it forward and you watch them pay it forward. It's just, um, uh, it's wonderful to see the wave after wave of innovation and personalities um uh, yeah. over time but yeah it's thanks. it's it's an inspiration for sure now yeah. we're going to transition a bit into the final part of this conversation uh, a little bit of a look back and a little bit of a look ahead um and i'm going to pose what is a really hard question to you and that is that when you reflect on your career and the impact you've had so far what are you most proud of you know i there was one period uh, in the evolution of Lotus Notes that um, gave me a better feeling than I've ever had. And that was, um, it's hard to go back into that era, but at, in that time, uh, one company, Novell um, and Lotus were both, uh, we both had early network products and we both sold them through channels, channels of distribution. And, um, 
both companies had about, for about every dollar that we sold of product, um, the, uh, the channel sold eight or nine dollars and it was a billion dollar business for us. So that, you know, there were 89, eight or nine billion, maybe 10 billion of aggregate value in the ecosystem. But I had never understood this ecosystem. And I would have, we would have this conference, Lotusphere, and these people would come up and say, you don't understand how you changed my life. I, you, you're, you're putting my kids through school. Right. I met my spouse um, over here. Um, you know, he or she was a customer. And now we, you know, the, the number of lives that you touch from an economic perspective um, uh, and, and have the ability to see it and witness what happens, that was just so incredibly rewarding. rewarding. The same thing, of course, happens with employees. Um, if you build companies and you see, um, you see that progression. But to me, the most rewarding thing is not the technology. Um, it's just how I might have been able to improve someone else's life um, in, a, in a funny kind of indirect way. And it's, uh, it's very gratifying. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, you mentioned a little bit about Blues Wireless, your new company. And I know mm -hmm. you love the blues, so I'm sure that's where the, <laughs> the name comes yep. from. Yeah, you gave a, a nice description. I've taken a look at at the details behind it. Um, I'm going to ask you a question now relative to your excitement about the future, and I'm guessing that it might be tied into your belief system and 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 what you're working on today with Blues. But let's talk a little bit about the future and weave in, you know, your your level of excitement. What do you see the possibilities to be in the future? Yeah, very concretely, of course, I am extremely excited about this new this new company and the opportunity. I've been working on it for about three years. Um, for for probably eight years now, um, many in the industry have been projecting that IoT was just going to explode, and it hasn't exploded. It's it's you know taken a while, um, but I'm I kind of believe like Masa San that there are going to be a trillion. Um, IoT devices out there embedded in most everything and ignore the, for just a moment um, the creepy surveillance aspect of IoT. It's, it, there, are, there are ways like many technologies you can misuse it, but um, uh, just take what Safecast is doing. There is no better way. We've never had an opportunity to monitor the environment, to understand, you know, maybe we could have prevented Flint if we had been doing um, uh, water monitoring all the way at the edge in people's homes. Um, you know, maybe beaches could be safe. Maybe we would know what rivers, uh, we'd know where the major polluters are, what neighborhoods um, they are affecting more than others. And um, uh, this, that same thing go, crosses over to, um, uh, to the commercial realm. Uh, you know, we are in a service oriented era. That was what the whole transformation at Microsoft was about. It's everything as a service. And um, there are people who have propane tanks and, and you know, uh, different types of assets and supply chains that are being moved around. Um, all of these things can help give people more visibility into what's going on. And I think it's going to end up being uh, fundamentally transformational in customer service. Beyond Blues, though, I'll just say one thing. And, and um, the biggest thing I'm, I'm optimistic about is I don't know if you know, remember, but just a minute ago, I was saying, you know, you kind of predict the future by overlaying these charts of where things are going up and to the right. Um, this is a discontinuity. The pandemic was a discontinuity. Mm -hmm. Wars create discontinuities. This pandemic is, and that completely changes the game. This, right. this fundamentally accelerated how the changes, fundamental changes in how we work. The financial system, many things, healthcare, uh, the way you know now we're going to probably use mRNA in in lots of different ways. There are so many things that are now going to be discontinuous because of this, and so the really successful entrepreneurs are right now trying to look at the landscape and go, okay, what what were, what assumptions were we making that are just blown up, and five years from now, how does that change the landscape? Yeah, no, it's fascinating when you think about it because. It wasn't too long ago, for the most part, within a reasonable lifetime, um, people were the computers, right? And right. then we invented um, these things, these microprocessors and other things. And now as they fade into the woodwork, um, how they are employed in service to the greater good is, is really key. 
And that to me is, is really this exciting moment for us in the industry and, and for, for us at CHM to be able to celebrate you know, the insights that people like you bring to the table, um, given the trajectory and the arc of, of your contributions, which are so immense and, and fundamental, frankly. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk with you about this. Uh, and as we, as we think forward, uh, I, wanna, I wanna thank you again on behalf of everyone, because one of the things that you're going to allow us to do right now <laughs> is to take a private tour of some of your collection, because we're not able to do that at the Computer History Museum today, but we're gonna go into Ray's house for a little minute. So there you go. let's take a little look. <laughs> this is probably my most interesting asset. It is a... Um, it is a, an original Plato terminal. University of Illinois uh, gifted it. And it's unlike many that are out there, it is a complete Plato terminal and it's in, in great condition. This plasma panel, which normally it's, you know, it's orange dots. Um, the touch panel is working. You've got rows of LEDs and photo, uh, photo diodes. Um, the microfiche projector in it um, is present. I'm not sure if, if that's completely working. I ha in the closet, I have a, a tank of compressed air that can operate it, but essentially here is the you know, microfiche. The vision was a multimedia terminal, although they didn't use those words, and that means audio visual, and that's the visual part. This is the audio part, so that was a French geography lesson. This is the audio disc that would go along with that lesson. This was the computer that I used when I co-wrote Lotus Symphony with Barry Spencer and Matt Stern. This was, you know, the, the whole symphony effort was a quarter million lines of assembly language done in from first line of code until ship in nine months. Such a memorable device, um, the TRS-80 Model 100. This was a writing machine. You know, you could be on an, this wasn't a, a communicator. I mean, maybe some people use it that way, but what I would do is um, if I had to fly six hours somewhere, I would just take this and I could write a spec or I could, you know, write a proposal, write, you know, it, it you could focus it. You know, it was just several lines and the keyboard, just like that grid, you know, there's some, there's an amazing similarity between that clack that clack and the grids, you know, clack. I just, I, I love the feel of those things. We were under NDA with Microsoft uh, and both at Software Arts and at Iris, where I did Lotus Notes uh, with Tim and Len. And uh, we had source code so that we could either make changes, send it back, report bugs, do do whatever we needed to do. and and. Uh, Bill was extremely empathetic, uh, empathic about what um, what it was like to be a developer without DOC. And so here's the DOS two sources, DOS three sources. Here's the Windows, you know, from '85 Windows kernel user GDI uh, supplemental, you know, uh, uh, tools sources. This is a VisiCalc for for the IBM PC, Lotus 123. I'll say this is, this binder is so memorable to me. Microsoft uh, let us have the source code and this was this essentially a listing of kernel, you know, GDI and user with all of our scribblings of the bugs that we found and fixed. Um, so that whenever you'd run into a problem, you'd run over and look at the binder to see if, you know, hey, has Tim already found this or has Len, you know, already fixed this one? Um, this was more or less uh, GitHub for um, for our changes. So I, I just thought this was this was great. Well. Ray, what an incredible collection. Thank you for sharing that. It rivals the museum. You've got some things there that, uh, that are really quite incredible. And you, 
are drawing on my memory, I'll take a moment and pause. Uh, early 1982, I visited the University of Illinois campus and I visited Don's lab and I saw that orange glow in those early plasma displays. They were a little bit like room heaters, uh, as everybody knows, or anyone who's had a plasma display. But it was the beginning, and it was an incredible moment uh, for anyone who thought about computing and how it should amplify human potential. And your story is, is uh, just gelling and, and fundamental to, I think, so many uh, people's worldview of what computing can do in service to the human condition. So thank you for, for sharing that. Thank you for keeping that terminal and that display alive. Um, that's one of the things that we don't do at the museum. You've done a wonderful thing uh, by sharing that with all of us tonight. Uh, so again, we can't thank you enough. So to help make the program possible, this 2021 Fellows Award Series, I'm here tonight to thank Accenture as our headline sponsor. We're going to hear from them in the main stage in a little while. But for eight years, Accenture has supported this important program and helped to share the stories of our remarkable fellows. And I'd also like to thank our education sponsor, the KLA Foundation, and their support for the 2021 Fellow Awards. It's an incredible opportunity, again, for us to, to thank our sponsors. We couldn't do it without your support. Now it's time for us to move to the main stage where we will be joined by well over a thousand others who will join us for this award ceremony and the full program. I'm Marguerite Gong Hancock, Vice President of Innovation at the Computer History Museum. On behalf of CHM, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our 2021 Fellow Awards. For over three decades, CHM's Fellow Awards have recognized technology pioneers, legends, and unsung heroes who have advanced the field of computing and propelled humanity forward. Our first fellow was Grace Hopper, a trailblazer of software programming. I'm reminded of something that Grace said. The most dangerous words in our language are, that's the way it has always been done. She embodies the fellow spirit to drive innovation and champion bold change. Since Grace, CHM has presented this prestigious award to 88 fellows, including many who are in the audience tonight. Truly, these fellows have changed our world. The museum is honored to shine a light on their innovative spirit, to preserve and share the remarkable stories, to examine the impact and relevance of their work for us today and to inspire the next generation. How are fellows selected? Nominations are made through an extensive public process. The final selections are made by an independent panel of experts. In fact, you could make a nomination for next year. 2021 marks a new era for our fellow awards. This is our first virtual awards ceremony. And believe me, I've never been on a stage like this before. But the good news is, through the power of technology, we're able to connect with you from around the world as part of CHM's growing community. More are participating in tonight's Fellows Awards program than ever before. In years past, we've hosted a single event in our auditorium at the museum. But this year, Fellows celebrations will span 2021 with three more events plus companion content between now and December. These will offer ways to learn about remarkable change makers, advance the dialogue about tech today, and reflect on how we can make a positive impact. Now I'm thrilled to introduce our CHM president and CEO, Dana Lewin. Before Dana took the helm of the museum in 2018, he was an original member of the Apple Macintosh team, co-founder with Steve Jobs of Next, and a Microsoft executive leading global entrepreneurship and venture capital outreach, as well as tech for good initiatives. He's also served as chair of the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, the largest community foundation in the world. Drawing on his extensive experience in Silicon Valley, Donald is leading the transformation of CHM 
into a leading museum at the intersection of technology and humanity for the 21st century. Please welcome Dana Lewin. Thank you, Marguerite. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm joining you live from our virtual stage in Mountain View, California. At CHM, we're committed to decoding technology to shape a better future. Artificial intelligence, biotech, networking, and other technologies are redefining what it means to be human. They're reshaping how we access information, how we communicate, how we learn, work, and even how we imagine. And while the future may be unimaginable, one thing is certain, our future will rely ever more on technology. Our ability to solve problems, realize our personal potential, and express our sense of humanity will be defined by the technologies we create and employ. This begs the question, and I pose it to all of you, what kind of world do you want to live in? This is the conversation that needs to surface. To inform that conversation, we're collaborating with SurveyMonkey to deepen our understanding of public opinion on technology and society. Here are a few benchmarks from a national survey completed this week. On the one hand, during the pandemic, between 59 and 77 percent of Americans report more positive feelings towards technology. On the other hand, 36 percent feel that overall technology has a negative impact on society, a 10 percent increase in the last three years. 72 percent of the respondents trust museums and NGOs to understand the impact of technology, a significantly higher percentage than for government or media. So at CHM, we're working to earn your trust by helping decode technology, the promise and perils for everyone. Together, we can chart a positive path forward that will benefit the greater good. This is expressed in our new mission statement. To decode technology, its computing past, the digital present, and the future impact on humanity. Our goal is measurable reach and impact on the next generation of digital citizens to shape a better future. And we're working hard to create meaningful experiences, discourse, and insights. And we're expanding our digital capabilities and systems infrastructure to reach new audiences, to bring people together with great content and programming, and to become more compelling recipient for your support. And that's why I'm particularly excited about this year's virtual Fellows Awards program that uses technology to build community and engage people around the world. Who are the pioneers and visionaries we celebrate as fellows? How can they stimulate our imaginations to build a better future? Here's a video to share more about our Fellows Award program and to let you hear from some of our past honorees. In the words of Dr. Katherine Johnson, and I quote, you are providing a platform for so many to share their story, and together we are rewriting history in a way that allows everyone to see their place. For more than three decades, the Computer History Museum has reserved one honor for a distinguished circle of individuals who have advanced the field of computing. So I figured that if I could start on the ground floor with other people, then I'd have a chance to get ahead. And that was what led me to write the first compiler back in 1952. And it was set up as a as a crusade rather than to make money. The CHM Fellow Awards recognize technology pioneers, legends, and unsung heroes who have illuminated our world and propelled humanity forward. The semiconductor industry has made bigger changes in a few decades than printing has over a few centuries. When these things actually start to connect, you get the wow effect. Democracy, freedom, prosperity, they all stem from technological innovation. We've got to make a society that will last, that is sustainable as a society. 
That's one of the reasons I developed my computer and gave it away. I wanted to help that revolution go forward. If every one of us does our job well, it'll all go very interesting. When the ideas start, they are fragile and they're new. And most people don't understand them. And the things that are fragile need to be protected. They are the dreamers who imagine beyond what is, the disruptors who challenge convention, the builders who transform our world. They are the history makers who inspire us all to keep exploring and creating new ways to shape a better future for everyone. This year, we're building on this important CHM tradition, but in a reimagined way. We'll explore each of our honorees, their life's work and impact, through the lenses of past, present, and future, with an array of storytellers and tributes. The accomplishments of this year's fellow award honorees span robotics, collaboration, computer graphics, entrepreneurship, art, and education. Each fellow exemplifies leadership in a carefully chosen theme that represents their life's work and passion and embodies CHM's mission to decode technology. And now, without further ado, these are the CHM 2021 fellows. Collaborative technology creator and entrepreneur, Raymond Ozzi. AI and robotics pioneer, Raj Reddy. Computer artist Lillian Schwartz, and computer graphics and hypertext pioneer Andreas Andy Van Dam. So, wherever you are, please join me in applauding these distinguished honorees. Thank you. I really appreciate it, and I know they do. This is an incredible opportunity and an incredible class. This year, we have this great class. And I'm excited for our event this evening as we kick off a year of celebrations. And all of that we have in store for you for the 2021 Fellows Awards would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. Thank you to our education sponsor, the KLA Foundation, and absolute special appreciation to our program's headline sponsor, Accenture. This is the eighth year that Accenture has shown their support as the program's headline sponsor. So on behalf of CHM, our board of trustees, staff and volunteers, I want to say thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce CHM trustee and group chief executive of technology and CTO worldwide of Accenture, Paul Doherty. Paul? Thank you, Daniel. It's such a pleasure to be part of the Computer History Museum and the 2021 Fellows event. At Accenture, we've seen what happens when the promise of technology meets human ingenuity, but perhaps never quite as clearly as in this time. I mean, just think about the past year with lives disrupted, lives lost, homes becoming schools and offices, celebrations and events postponed, canceled, or reinvented, billions of people across the world brought to a standstill. But that's not the end of the story. COVID did something else. It hit a giant fast forward button into a future defined by new realities. New realities around human experience, reshaping the way we work and live, and new realities around technology. The world's being reshaped by two truths. First, every business is now a technology business. Technology is the lifeline that kept businesses, governments, and our communities running, and it's the key to redefining the future in every industry to solving the big problems we face. And the second truth is that the exponential pace of technology innovation will continue to accelerate creating new possibilities and the need to learn, change, and adapt faster. For these reasons, we're now at a pivotal time, a moment of truth, and this is why the Computer History Museum is so special. CHM plays a unique and essential role in capturing the amazing stories as we interpret the past and provide the pathways as we invent the future. A future that's been enabled and inspired by individuals like Ray Ozzie, the other 2021 CHM fellows, and the fellows that have come before. And that's why I'm so pleased and proud to be on the board of trustees of the museum and to represent Accenture as sponsor of the 2021 fellows. Getting this right couldn't be more important. 
Each and every one of us have the opportunity to shape the future that we want to see, inspired by the pioneering spirit, the accomplishments, and the impact of the change makers being honored by this year's Computer History Museum Fellows. Back to you, Daniel. Thank you, Paul. It's true. This past year has changed life as we know it. We've all experienced how technology has redefined our world as a vehicle for personal connection, a tool for problem solving, and an engine for future possibilities. With deep appreciation to you, Paul, and all of the Accenture employees around the world, we thank you so much for your continued support of this milestone program. You know, it makes me think, uh, not long ago, we were visiting the Accenture headquarters, and you, Paul, were going through the worldview that Accenture has on a forward-looking basis. And the excitement that you and your colleagues share with the museum and those around the world who are really thinking through what digital transformation means, uh, it, it's, it's just phenomenal. And as we think about the world within which we live, um, you know, many of you, uh, I'm sure, are living and breathing in LinkedIn or have given up your contact list to work within LinkedIn. How many of you are using Facebook? How many of you are using Slack? And what about Clubhouse? There's this new sense of online communities and threads that tie together an incredible story which has a foundation in our fellow award honoree tonight, Ray Madazi. Now, Ray is a software pioneer and an entrepreneur, and frankly, he's a longtime friend of mine. He has spent an incredible lifetime thinking through and building low-level systems upon which many of the modern, current technologies are built. And he's devoted his life to building software and companies that connect people. It's a fundamental threat, and it's fundamentally important for all of us tonight as we think through the use of technology and how we act every day when we wake up and the systems we use, how we are actually shaping the future of computing. And with Ray's story, we're going to learn more about his passion for building, his entrepreneurial spirit, and everything that gets traced back into his early childhood. You know, we've learned a lot in working with Ray over the last month or so, putting much of this program together, dealing and in, in diving into deep oral histories and understanding his family and his upbringing and all the things that motivated his personal enthusiasm and energy for what he's done for the greater good of society and building these collaborative technologies. One of the things that I particularly like was uh, the story that Ray told about his grandfather. Uh, and how his grandfather in this, this suburban neighborhood had an incredible family workshop. And Ray would spend hours watching and participating and thinking and building things with his grandfather. Uh, another story was one where uh, Ray was making ends meet like so many of us back in those days. Uh, and he fixed doorbells for the neighborhood community when their doorbells broke. He was building and fixing things even back then. So if you haven't noticed, one of the core themes and one of Ray's themes that you're going to hear throughout the night is the use of the word build. It's fundamental to what we're all thinking about and how we're living and breathing today. You're going to hear more about the present and the future of technology for collaboration tonight. And you're going to hear the theme of trust and connection. And you're going to understand how those themes intersect through Ray's life, his life's work, the companies he's built, the impact that he's had on society. And so now, without further ado, let's hear a little bit about Ray's journey in his own words. Well, let's just start with uh, your full name and when and where you were born. <laughs> Raymond Edward Ozzy, Chicago, Illinois, uh, 1955. We would uh, do our programming on paper, punch it in into, you know, Hollerith cards and submit those card decks. You know, you would wait hours. You would just wait hours. Directly across the street from the digital computer lab, there was this other building. If you look through the windows, there was this orange glow and there were just people sitting at rows and rows and rows of these things I'd never seen before. The system was called Plato, and these things were terminals. It was a mix between students who were, who were using those terminals, people doing programming, 
and people doing gaming. I just was fascinated by this thing. I lost interest, of course, in punched cards. Don Bitzer had this attitude, which was, if you can imagine it, you can build it. It was the first time I was part of a team. There was the beginning of communications and online community. You started to get to know people very, very well at a distance. And we started to envision the system as a place, as opposed to just being um, a tool. I was assigned to work on a project with Gary Michael. He was remote. Occasionally I would get stuck and I would term talk him in real time. He was just the worst typist you could ever imagine. I mean, it was just so frustrating. How could somebody who's such a bad typist write up these long specs? And he hosted a little party after the project to celebrate. And I drove to his house, went in, and the reason why he was typing so slowly is he's a quadriplegic. I had no idea. It made me question my biases. Because if I had seen him, I would have been preoccupied with the fact that he's in this wheelchair. Um, and yet I had seen the other part of him and his sense of humor. That really made me want to work on communication tools. I began writing the business plan for what would eventually become Lotus Notes. Mitch Kapor was great. I gave him the whole pitch about this notes thing. He said, look, I will commit to you one thing. Right now, I will commit to you one thing. You come to join us and deliver 123 version two. When that thing ships, I will figure out how to get your thing funded. I went to work for Lotus. The day that it shipped, Mitch came down and he said, you did your job. You did exactly what I had asked you to do. Dust off your business plan and let's talk about how to get it funded. December 7th, 84, I called friends of mine from college and the three of us uh, set out to, to building Lotus Notes. The product at its core was about people working together in an organization to get things done together. IBM had been looking at Lotus Notes. They viewed that it could be a pivotal asset. There was a hostile takeover made of Lotus by IBM. And I stuck around for two years and I began to get itchy. Groove's core mission was to enable people to do the best dynamic collaboration that they possibly could. The moment 9-11 happened, we had a, an information sharing problem. And the nature of Groove technology was that it didn't need central servers. We were purchased by Microsoft, who saw the, the dynamic collaboration being a good way to plug into the bottom end of SharePoint. Bill said, I'm thinking about leaving the company and giving full time to the foundation. What do you think about taking my role? We've built the organization in a PC-centric way. You, Ray, seem to have ridden the wave of change that our industry has had to help lead the company. I took on the role knowing that it was not a technology job, it was a transformation job. By 2009, I had gotten in motion pretty much everything that needed to get in motion. The vast majority of my career has been spent in computer-supported cooperative work to help an organizational goal or outcome. When people would come up to me and say, it's 2020 and I'm still working on Lotus Notes and I built a company of 30 people and I put my kids through college, that to me is the ultimate reward. Wow, isn't it remarkable to hear Ray's story? Now, here are a couple of special guests with a tribute for Ray. Now, you may know him as the ABC reality show Shark Tank, or as the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, or you just may know him as Mark Cuban. Before becoming a billionaire and an NBA team owner, Mark was an eager entrepreneur looking at how to grow his business when he met Ray and discovered Lotus Notes. I can't say enough great things about Ray Ozzy. We're, we've done some work together. Um, we're on a committee together. We spent some time together. What an amazing human. What an incredible person who cares. 
not just about technology for technology's sake, but how it can help people and how it can make the the world a better place. But that that's everybody knows that about Ray. I got to tell you my little Ray Ozzy story. So way back in the day, 30 years ago plus, um, I had a little systems integrator, and to me the greatest find that would grow my little systems integrator micro solution was finding Lotus Notes. And bam, I reached out to, to um, Ray's company and they allowed us to become a reseller. And when that happened, literally our company just took off. They allowed me to sell it, they allowed me to promote it, and then it got bought by Lotus and worked with them. Um, but it just changed, changed the, the path of my company. And so bottom line, if it weren't for Ray Ozzy, I wouldn't be on Shark Tank. I wouldn't own the Dallas Mavericks. I'd probably be a bartender somewhere if it weren't for Ray Ozzy. So congratulations, Ray Ozzy. Every accolade you've ever gotten, you've earned. You're a good guy. Take care. All right, there you have it. I mean, Ray Ozzy saved Mark Cuban from becoming a bartender. Now, what more could you say? That's great. But really, thank you, Mark, for sharing your tribute to Ray with us here tonight. Now, in 1981, while I was working at Apple, I met our next guest at an Apple II ship party in Cupertino, California. He's the co-founder of Microsoft, a company where I spent 17 years of my own career and that is near and dear to my heart, as I'm sure it is to Ray. Ray founded two companies, Groove Networks and Taco, that were both acquired by Microsoft. And as you know, he also took over as the company's chief software architect from none other than Bill Gates. Congratulations to Ray Ozzy on getting this award. The Computer History Museum likes to honor both legends and unsung heroes, and Ray uh, definitely fits into both of those categories. Uh, you know, he started out uh, working on CDC Play-Doh for, you know, great uh, educational software, worked on BizaCalc, uh, built Symphony, uh, totally created Lotus Notes, which was an amazing thing, uh, you know, really advanced collaborative computing, uh, he was a great ISV for Windows, giving us more suggestions about how to make it work uh, than any other ISV. Uh, he and I have had a lot of fun working together. His, you know, systems architecture thinking, his, you know, hands-on uh, uh, writing of code and, you know, building great teams is a, a phenomenal thing. So even before Ray uh, came to Microsoft, uh, I, I greatly admired his work. Uh, and it was kind of a natural thing that uh, when Microsoft wanted somebody who had a broad view of product innovation, uh, that I uh, said to Steve, see Ballmer, hey, let's get Ray here, uh, and he can step up and make sure that uh, there's great innovations going on. Uh, so we're the same age. Uh, we have a lot in common. We still are passionate about, you know, encryption and IoT and how AI can come in and we can apply these technologies uh, in ways that, that help not just business, but disaster relief, education. Uh, you know, when Ray was at Microsoft, we had lots of these retreats. I remember, uh, you know, he was kind of phenomenal at the number of digits of pi he could remember. Uh, he went way beyond uh, uh, when I got knocked out. Uh, I think he actually may have been second. Um, uh, Kurt Dunleady may have been a, a few digits ahead of him, but uh, you know, I, I was impressed. Uh, I thought I, I was good at that kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, Ray stepped up uh, after I retired and, you know, got groups working together. And, you know, it's kind of amazing the number of great things uh, that Ray has done. Uh, and so it's, you know, super fitting uh, that he's getting this award. I'm sure he would say that, you know, his work's not done. He's not... <laughs> retired from uh, great software ideas, even his uh, latest IoT work, I think is uh, fantastic uh, and will make real contribution. So thanks, Ray, uh, for being a, a brilliant software thinker and all you've done for the world. Thank you, Bill. And Ray, 
we all know you're not finished yet. There's a lot more that you're going to work, work on in the future. So at this time, we'd like to begin our award presentation. Here to present the 2021 Fellow Award to Raymond Ozzie is Lotus co-founder and past CHM Fellow, Mitch Kapor. Mitch, as you've all heard tonight, was essential in the creation of Lotus Notes, investing in Ray and his company, Iris Associates, to develop the technology that would go on to transform the future of collaboration. Mitch is also a fellow of CHM, honored in 1996 for his development of Lotus 123, the first killer app for the IBM personal computer, which combines spreadsheets, charting and graphing, and basic database operations into one application. Mitch is a well-respected leader in the technology industry, an iconic entrepreneur, an investor in tech for social impact at Kapor Capital, and a champion of diversity and inclusion in the workplace with his wife, Frida, and the Kapor Foundation. So please join me in welcoming Mitch Kapor. Thank you, Daniel. It indeed is an honor for me to be a fellow of the Computer History Museum. Uh, the Fellow Award is a very special accolade it's considered one of the highest marks of achievement in the computing field. And it's my distinct honor to be presenting this prestigious award to Ray here tonight. So please join me in welcoming Ray Ozzie. Thank you, Mitch. Hi, Ray. Hi. Um, I could not let the evening go by without telling a couple of stories. Um, <laughs> and. You know, we were working on, uh, on, on spreadsheets and uh, my uh, partner and co-founder, John Sachs, in, uh, got you to come uh, to Lotus. And indeed, we made a deal that you talked about in the, in the documentary, uh, which is you lent a hand with something we needed to do with spreadsheets. And you got to do the project that was in your heart, which was Lotus Notes, which you had been thinking about since college. But as much as it was about technology, it was also about trust because none of us knew what we were getting into. I knew that we wanted to do this. I know that you and your team needed the autonomy to go off for a long period of time, far away and have many millions or tens of millions of dollars. And I trusted that you would deliver something and you trusted us and trusted me that Lotus was gonna be a good partner and bring this to market. And there were many bumps and turns in the road, but I say to this day that it was that trust that we exhibited Great. that you Great. have an integrity that actually made it, it possible. I agree. Ray, your ongoing work in entrepreneurship and collaboration and communication tools help people work together to build companies, products, and communities. And your life's work is centered on building connections that bring people together and that have impacted so many people around the globe. So Raymond Ozzy, on behalf of the Computer History Museum, it's my honor to present to you the 2021 Fellow Award for a lifetime of work in collaborative software and software entrepreneurship. Thank you, Mitch. <laughs> I really appreciate it. It is truly an honor, and thank you, thank you for your kind words. I, the, the, uh, I couldn't agree more that trust was so center, uh, central to what we did. But thanks again, and um, uh, thank you to everyone at the Computer History Museum who, um, who had, who had some involvement in in uh, in picking me. It's uh, this is just a great and highly unexpected honor. And it's such a, an extraordinary group of individuals that, um, that have been named museum fellows over the years. These are my heroes. And, and so just thank you for that honor. Um, you know, bef before I say anything else, but above all else, I just wanted to thank my wife and my partner of more than 40 years, Donna Busquet, for repeatedly pushing me away from what would have been an easier path and into the direction of what makes me happy, kind of encouraging me to do what she knows I feel gives my life meaning. 
Serial entrepreneurship is not easy on anyone. And in my case, it's meant repeatedly over the decades risking failure and all that implies to everyone. Um, this girl is one of a kind, so thank you, Donna. I appreciate it. My career has been and continues to be an amazing journey, an incredible adventure. I've been blessed. In, in my early childhood, until I was about eight years old, our family lived upstairs in a two flat above my grandparents in the heart of Chicago. As a young boy in that era, it's undeniable that I was most influenced by my grandfather and my dad. My grandfather was a first generation immigrant. He was a skilled craftsman, a metal worker who'd learned his trade through a rigorous ap apprenticeship in Europe. And as a kid, you know, living in the same house, I would sit in his workshop in the basement and watch quietly as he worked on his side projects. Um, I used to just love watching these projects taking shape and the smell of the, the, the workshop, the, the oil and metal shavings. When you grow up, he used to say, you'll have your own workshop. Get to know your materials, get to know your tools. The more you build, the more you learn. The more you learn, the better you'll be. You know, he said it in his own way, but he was just really focused on being the best at his craft. My dad, unlike my grandfather, wasn't a tradesman. He and his partner had built a small business, which he loved. Whereas my grandfather focused on his craft, my dad was always pushing me hard, even at a young age, to answer the questions of what and why. What are you going to do with your life? Why will it matter? Who will care? If you have a small business, will your customers remember you? Perhaps it was their, their, their immigrant attitude or a post-war growth mindset. But together, their message was crystal clear. Get off your ass, become skilled with your tools, and use those tools to build something that matters. Sitting here tonight, I owe a debt of gratitude to the many people under whom I apprenticed and who taught me about my materials and my tools and techniques. Uh, Jonathan Sachs, uh, Bob Frankson, both taught me about performance and the beauty of tight code. Through my friends and co-founders, Tim Halverson and Len Kaywell, who worked for him and who showed me his code, Dave Cutler, um, along with Tim and Len, uh, taught me most everything I know about structure, architectural modularity, maintainability of systems at scale, and um, intolerance for mediocrity. And I'm indebted to Ron Rivest, Charlie Kaufman, and Al Eldridge, who taught me about cryptography, about threat modeling, about the power of key management that fundamentally enabled Lotus Notes to exist, and which also fundamentally enabled Groove uh, to have a system of distributed consensus uh, as its fundamental arc underlying model. In addition to these craftsmen, though, there are a handful of people who've just deeply inspired me at a higher level and who have taken me to places that I just never imagined. They opened my eyes, they caused me to lose sleep. Don Bitzer and Paul Tenzar of Plato unquestionably were the first to make me realize that there's no vision and no project that's too large to be realized, even if it takes an uncomfortable degree of selling for an engineer and the occasional use of subversive tactics to keep projects alive in the face of danger. Dan Bricklin, Mitch Kapor, and Dave Weiner left an indelible impression on me in appreciating the power of tools for creativity and tools for productivity and how those tools could fundamentally transform how businesses operate and how, all, how we all work. Doug Engelbart, Ted Nelson, Irene Greif, and Tom Malone all caused me to see the bigger picture in what we were building. Um, our conversations and their writings about coordination theory, transaction cost economics, computer supported cooperative work caused me to push myself and my teams to try to realize the much deeper and broader human and macroeconomic impact of our work. I mean, most of the people who worked for me thought they were working on software, um, but these people helped me realize this was, this was about something much, much, much bigger. Finally, at a personal level, I'd just like to thank the two longtime friends who really bet on me and who really took a risk and gave me a chance not just to build, 
but also to grow as a person and as a leader. Um, by giving me his trust, Bill Gates gave me the chance to understand firsthand what it was like to catalyze business transformation at scale. I really had no idea. I, I learned a tremendous amount about leadership, about social and organizational dynamics, about people, and about change. And so, Bill, thank you for that. And perhaps above all else, I just want to thank Mitch Kapor. Uh, certainly at a base level, I owe much of my career to Mitch, who bet on me in 1983 when nobody understood what the hell I was trying to do with PCs and networks and collaboration. But far, far beyond that, he was the first individual that to me demonstrated leadership characteristics that just made me want to follow him and to emulate. We were all who worked for him drawn to the power in what he mentioned, in his trust, in his empathy, in his tendency to pay it forward, and in what he was trying to do in build a, building a diverse organization, one that genuinely fit into the community of Cambridge. Mitch, thank you for leaving your mark on me and on so many others. I know that many young people follow this event, so let this gray-haired person uh, just kind of conclude by leaving you with one thought. For good reason, it's clear that one way to affect societal change is to take direct action by tearing things down. And in so many cases today, that is exactly the right thing to do. But over the decades, I've come to believe that the act of building can be one of the purest forms of activism. Uh, as Larry Lessig said, and as you've seen in modern tech, code is law, for good or bad, right or wrong. And so one of the most powerful things that you can do to change the situation is to take direct action by building something. Do you care about social justice? Care about healthcare? Do you wanna build a more empathic enterprise? a more perfect union, a sustainable environment, then I'd suggest that you, maybe you shouldn't waste your time rebuilding what's been built over and over or chasing taillights. Take a risk and blaze a new trail. What have you got to lose? Get off your ass, take the time to master your tools, build a team and build something that'll change the world. It is possible. Thank you. Congratulations, Ray. It's truly an honor to celebrate you as our newest CHM Fellow. As we consider the ripple effects of the pioneering work of Ray and other innovators who followed, we're next going to explore the issues and impact of tech for collaboration, connection, and communication today. To start this portion of the program, we're going to try something new and have a little bit of fun. We have a surprise, a special guest, who exemplifies collaboration and technology in the arts through contemporary music. Crowned the world's first female beatbox champion, she's performed with Earth, Wind & Fire, Wycliffe Jean, and other musical legends. This evening, she's going to play in her unique way with combining technology, collaboration, and creativity to create a brand new song, a fellow award song inspired by tonight's theme, Build. She'll start by building her musical track layer by layer, and she needs your help because you are writing the lyrics. Right now, in the chat, we want you to write one word or phrase to answer this question. What will you build to help create a better world? Tonight's artist will use your words to build the song together in real time. Join me in giving a very warm welcome to Butterscotch.
we're all gonna write a song together about building. So please write any word or phrase that you want to see in this world. And I'm gonna make it into a song. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna, yeah, 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 yeah. We gotta amplify diverse voices, yeah. To have a more perfect union, yeah. Because we gotta have everybody, yeah. That is inclusion, yeah, yeah, yeah. We gotta have connectivity to you and me. That's how it's gonna be. We need kindness and equity all around the omniverse. We feel the love with access for all. Just sit back and rhyme with the words that you give me. And this is how we flow, and this is how we go now. We're building a better world. Yeah, you gotta have that trust in the future. You gotta listen to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in a better world mm. you gotta have compassion and give before you think and give before you receive respect for all hey, hey. gotta gotta make this world a better place what you gonna build to make it a better place more inclusion, more diversity, cultures of loving all races. We are one, we are one, yeah. We gotta celebrate and embrace each other, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 We're gonna build a better world. gonna build, yeah, yeah, what you gonna risk, yeah, yeah, you gotta, you gotta believe, yeah, we're building a better world now, look back, I pay it forward, you gotta be grateful, no need to be hateful, you gotta be grateful, Get it done, get it done. Building yeah. a better world. We're building a better world. A better world. A better world. Building a better world. Thank you, Butterscotch. That was amazing. Right now, we're going to be joined by a circle of thought leaders who are joining us live from around the country to continue our, our exploration of tech for collaboration and connection. They'll address critical issues 
and their implications for us today. Here to lead the discussion and to introduce tonight's panelists is our moderator, tech journalist, Wired Magazine editor-at-large, and longtime friend of the museum, Stephen Levy. Over to you, Stephen. Well, thank you, Marguerite. And it is such an honor to be hosting this panel to honor Ray and talk about some of his ideas. We have an amazing panel tonight. I'll introduce them. I'll only give the shortest introductions because you can learn much more about them. You probably know everything about them uh, already because you know they're part of our community here. First, uh, Esther Dyson. She's a tech media pioneer, journalist, uh, angel investor, health advocate. Uh, we got Barat Tunde Thurston, Emmy nominated writer, activist, comedian, uh, and Finally, uh, certainly not least, Dana Boyd, who is the partner researcher at Microsoft Research and the founder of Data and Society, visiting professor of New York University, and you know the the goddess, I guess, of you know social sciences and networking. Uh, welcome all of you. Uh, now, I think we're going to talk about a lot of the implications of the connectivity that Ray helped bring into being and has been working on and for all these years. But first I wanna have each panelist maybe share a, a little bit of, of their connection with Ray and what they think of when they think of, of Ray and a connectivity. And we'll go on and tackle some issues from there. Uh, Esther, why don't we start with you? Okay, so in order to prepare for this, first of all, I wore my Lotus shirt. And second, I went and read some things I had written about Ray and notes and groove and so forth back in the day. And it's, it's amazing how, many, how much, so first of all, he was one of the nicest guys in the industry. Um, he just, you, you heard his shout out to his wife. He's, he's just a class act and he was just fun to be around. I mean, he was, he didn't just do collaboration software, he actually collaborated. Uh, the second big thing was, you know, we, we still have a problem now. We, we used to have email, now we have Slack. Uh, but Slack and texting, they're, they're getting as bad as email. There's just so much stuff there, you can't find it. And Ray's insight was that the text may be unstructured, natural language, et cetera. And so you can search it with words, but there's also structure to it. Uh, emails, there, there's this wonderful term, speech transactions. And you know, an email can be setting up a meeting. It can be an answer to another email. There's a structure to the communications. There's a structure to the work three people contribute to that. One person changes it. Another person needs to be notified. And it's, it's not all hierarchical. It's not just little pieces making bigger pieces. It's, it's much closer to a web or a graph. And he understood that part of it and, and tried to help build in the structure of collaboration as well as just the stream of words and the, the mounds of data, a shared database has its own structure, but the structure of work among people is is much more interesting, and it's something we're still wrestling with now. Right, uh, Baratunde, uh, how about you? Yeah, I um I grew up in the '80s, born in '77, got online around '93, and I have never met Ray Ozzy in person, though I love his initials order R E O, kind of a speed wagonish vibe going there, Ray. Um, so I used to fix computers to help pay for my college education. And I worked in computer networking and a small business in Cambridge, Mass. And they were on Lotus Notes. So my first interaction with Ray Ozzy's world was trying to fix some of the things that workers had to deal with. It was very exciting. And I was such a nerdy tech person that I was actually thrilled about Groove Networks. None of my friends, of course, knew what I was talking about, but I was in the know. Uh, I also just want to acknowledge and give a few quick shout outs uh, to Mark Cuban, who acknowledged that he would be a bartender were it not for Ray Ozzy. So we can thank Ray for unleashing Mark Cuban on us. Uh, to Butterscotch, the most appropriately named artist with that smooth groove. And of course, to Esther Dyson for the best Zoom background I've ever seen. Well done, Esther. <laughs> I thought it was a short-term joke, but it's a long-term joke. 
Yeah, maybe too long. Uh, Dana, uh, how about you? No, it's, it's so great to be here with everyone tonight. Um, you know, I was a student of Andy Van Dam's, another one of this class, uh, when I was first learned about Ray's work. And I have to admit, I had met a lot of luminaries, uh, you know, working with Andy, that I had grown a little wary of a lot of them, where I'm like, I don't know that I actually want to meet them, because they turn out to not always be so nice. And I have to admit, the first time I met Ray, I'm like, he's actually really nice. And I was like, oh, OK, maybe that's just this, you know, this moment. And then I got to actually spend time with him working at, uh, with him when I was at MSR. He understood and appreciated research. He understood and appreciated people who were more junior to him, helping elevate people, helping recognize talent in really profound ways. That you know, person who really understands how you build not just networks of technology, but networks of people. And it's about trust and respect, generosity and kindness. And so you know, I think that this is a moment where we're all celebrating his technical achievements, but I think it's also really important to acknowledge just what an amazing human Ray is. And that is the, the part that makes me so glad to be here tonight. Yeah, I, 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 I first met Ray myself in 1984 at the first Hackers Conference um, you know, it was kind of like a, like a fun book party for me, but it, it's a gathering of the tribes that Stuart Brand and Kevin Kelly used to bring a lot of people together. And, and I got to know him a lot better uh, in the 1990s when I was writing about cryptography. And it was so essential to Lotus Notes that he'd be able to provide security. And in the process, he wound up fighting for all of us to get encryption liberated from the government. Um, but I really didn't get Ray totally till I did a long profile of him that actually you saw for like a few seconds in, in the main room for Wired Magazine when he uh, went to Microsoft and became chief software architect. And that was when he was building their cloud system. Um, and uh, that's when I delved back into his Plato days. And we've already talked a lot about that tonight, but that was kind of a utopia for connectivity that was raised North Star. And I thought of that and I thought about where we are now because while connectivity has given us so much, in another sense, you know, we have kind of a nightmare on our hands of, of some of the effects of connectivity. So in the you know, few minutes left we have in, the, in this panel, I wanna explore some of this with uh, you brilliant people, you know, to ask some questions like who, who's been building today's tech uh, and you know, uh, how can they be more collaborative and trustworthy as you talked about Dana? And how can we make choices that help tech better serve us and our communities. And maybe I'll start with you, Esther, because you know you were key date back to the days when personal computers were unconnected. And you've watched that whole evolution as we started using them for conferencing and sharing and connecting. And I'm curious to, to know if you feel that sometimes in the early days we were on to things that somehow we might have lost in, in the time since. Well I mean, there was certainly back when Stuart started the well, which stood for whole earth electronic link. Yeah, yeah. There, you know, there was all these issues around anonymity. And I mean, even then, the, the problem isn't the technology, it's the people using it. And we, again and again, we forget that if you're going to create a large platform, you need to create the governance structure for it as well. I remember trying to find out from eBay how much money they spent on fraud and dispute resolution and stuff like that. And they would never admit how much it was, but it's, it's like we need government and even in the private sector or the, you know, whatever you want to call the internet, it's kind of somewhere in between. Uh, whenever you have a lot of power, some people show up and misuse it. And so, I think transparency, the, the more power you have, the more transparency you need. You know, if all you're gonna do is walk down the street, you, you should have total privacy. And now of course, if you walk down the street without a mask, you may be carrying a deadly weapon. And so that, it's interesting how COVID-19 is to some extent upending some of our privacy issues. And it's also, to go off on a tangent, revealing a lot of you know, disparities in health and 
working conditions and so forth and so on. And those, those aren't things that the internet's going to fix. What uh, the internet can fix is it reduces friction. We need to put some friction back in actually. Well, that's certainly what we had, you know, that's why I asked you that in the, in the earlier days, it was all about friction. Everything, you know, yeah. was harder. You actually had to pay per minute when you were online, right? And now, you know, we've got this abundance. Uh, Baratunde, you, you've watched that evolution since the 90s. And since then, it, you know, it wasn't really quite as ubiquitous as it is now. And what, what, what came with that? Uh, good, bad, and ugly, Stephen. Um, and if we could just bring dial-up screeching sounds back, that would be <laughs> kind of a nice feature. Maybe I can launch that as an NFT before the night is through. I think it's a ringtone. There you go. There you go. So I, there's so many ways to think about that question. I have a, the positive answer in, in my own evolution is watching this network technology and collaboration get beyond what is just enhanced broadcast. Uh, a lot of the ways we've seen people, companies, and other parties use these tools is to reach at people more efficiently and effectively, and then extract value from them more efficiently and effectively. So you can talk to more, more easily, maybe even listen to them more easily, but uh, the ability to let people talk directly to each other, sort of edge to edge connections, that's been really powerful in my own creative endeavors and writing and politics, um, and also in people's political organizing. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a broadly good thing. It's a decentralization of power. But to add on to Esther's point, uh, and what Dana said earlier about it's the people, it's the culture, it's the governance. Governance. I think a lot of us had maybe um, unwittingly hoped that it would just be sort of pro-democracy forces who wanted to use collaborative tools. And it turns out Nazis like to collaborate too. Um, and that we would have a lot of sharing of files and a lot of collaboration around content, but not necessarily collaboration and sharing of the economic value created by that activity. And so we created this world of tremendous concentration of power, hoarding of data, hoarding of influence, and extraction of value from the edge toward a very few points in the center. I don't think, I don't think that's the grand, beautiful vision that we are capable of living up to. Hmm. Well, Dana, I know you talk a lot about where the human is in the interaction, and you know, breaking through the impersonality of the screen. And uh, so you watched as maybe things did veer somewhat off the rails. Um, what, what happened between Plato and now to make that happen? I think part of it is recognizing things have always been simultaneously off the rails and on them. It's not that there has actually been this moment where the internet was only used for good thing and never bad thing. And even now, it's not like all of it is bad. It's this complicated relationship. And Baratunde mentioned it, but it's sort of been my big commitment, which is the internet mirrors and magnifies the good, bad, and ugly. And I think part of what's challenging as a builder, you dream of all of the possibilities. You dream of what can be, what you hope you can create. And that's amazing. That's what makes a builder so powerful. And yet you also have to think about the checks and balances. Esther mentioned this challenge of governance, right? Which is this moment of saying, you need people to think about where this is really gonna go wrong. And you need the structures that are gonna listen to that because it's about finding that balancing act. And part of what is challenging is that, you know, the days of Plato, the days of Well, the days of Usenet, this was a very small number of people online. And it was a lot easier to pressure people into social norms. But let's also acknowledge things like rec.pets.cats, which went way off the rails into recipes on how you could eat cats, right? Like there were a lot of things that went wrong. But then you add in layers of money and power and politics. You add in the possibility that if you game a system, you can profit significantly. You can build a business off of you know, arbitrage, if you will. And you started to see the financialization of the tech industry become a huge challenge for it. You started to see the gameplay. So we were all still imagining that this would be a tool of empowerment, but it did empower people and it also created conditions that put people in vulnerable places. And I think that's this weird reminder about tools. 
they don't fix the problems in society, right? They don't come and say, hey, you had a problem in society. If you build a tool that connects the people, the problem will be done. And that's one of the things that I think about with regard to networks. Networks get made and remade. They're constantly negotiated. And one of the things that I think we have to constantly remember is, what are the networks that we need to function within our society in a healthy way? And how do we envision those kinds of networks rather than assuming that if we just build the technology, the networks will happen? And that's part of the beauty of this conversation because there's a moment to envision what the world of networks should look like, not just assume that they will, you know, if you build it, they will come. Right. Well, Ray always gave a lot of thought to that. Now when we think about networks, we have this metaphor of turning the dials. That's how people are going to interact with each other. So the people who start the thing, the founders of, of these, these companies, they say, well, Mark Zuckerberg got, Facebook was successful because he turned the dials in the right way and, and hit, hit a sweet spot. Now we wonder about those, those dials, right? Um, yeah. So what, what do you think we have learned about how code creates culture? I mean, I don't think it's the code, I Sorry, Esther. Okay, go ahead, finish. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Danny, you start. Yeah. Real. So I, I don't think that it's that code creates culture. I think culture is co-constructed with all of the tools around us. And I think that part of the dynamic is that culture is constantly being made and remade based on what we have available to us. And you know, we heard beautiful music that is the co-construction of a phenomenal artist and a set of tools. That's also true here. And so I think it's also reminding that this is a constant iteration and evolution. And that's one of the reasons why it's important when we build systems that we also watch what happens to them as they evolve, because it has to be a constant dance. It can't be simply you put down a platform and assume that you know the culture that comes out of it is going to be what you imagined it to be. Mm. Esther? I think one thing that when, when the technology removes the friction, it there's a lot of addiction going on on the internet. And you know, first I thought, oh, what a clever trope. Facebook is addictive. But in the last five to 10 years, I've learned that addiction isn't about the substance. It's about the behavior pattern of wanting relief and getting it. And it's, it's, it's short-term thinking in the extreme. So, I mean, it, it offends me that Robin Hood says it's democratizing investing because it's actually making gambling more accessible. And you know, human beings are vulnerable to short-term thinking. We, we're vulnerable now to abundance because we evolved as a species to live in a time of scarcity and grab what we could find because we needed it. And now those same instincts are, are fostering we're a short-term society, whether it's individuals or institutions looking for, not just for sustainable profits, but for, they want to sell their businesses rather than run them. And it's, the internet sort of creates this platform for everybody to ra be racing faster than the other guy. And somehow as a culture, we need to figure out how to resist that, how to put some friction back in, how to get people to think longer term. And it's, it's a fundamental, huge problem that transcends the internet, but is, is very much, you know, yeah, one click shopping, all this stuff. Uh, can I jump in here, Stephen? I don't know why we're doing on time. If you well, we're open to all here. Yeah, so uh, I want to add on to what I'm hearing here. It's really, it's really beautiful and thoughtful. I'm just like kind of honored to be surrounded by this greatness. Um, three things that I, I think it's three. We'll see if it ends up being three. It might be two that I think we've learned or are trying to learn. One is that um, there's power involved, and there's always like a contention or wrestling over power, and we're not engaged in a fair fight. I think the concentrations of like computing power, financial power, mathematical power, um, to, to Esther's point about addiction, the just say no thing doesn't work so much in some of these new network technologies. Like the atomic individual us is up against applied mathematics and behavioral science and trillions of dollars of market capital. And so that to say we choose these things isn't always 
the most honest version of events. Uh, the other thing I think we've learned uh, in terms of re-injecting friction in is a lot of the building of the initial spark was kind of to escape the mess of people. We could codify it and thus mm-hmm. avoid town hall meetings and human arguments and just embed it in the code. Now you just follow what the code says, but that's not democracy. And small d democracy is messy and it requires us to engage with each other to negotiate uh, as Dana was talking about and, and be okay with the mess and work through it, not just click to opt out of it in the sake of efficiency as the highest human value. And, and the last thing, I saw something in the chat here at Computer History and someone said, uh, Plato had sexist behavior on it too. And I think the third lesson that I keep trying to remember is we have to listen to the people who are telling us not everything's all right. And you know we can talk about the innocent time that was, but it wasn't that innocent for a lot of people. Um, and so if we actively listen to the voices of folks who are being harmed or excluded or, or not heard, then we could make a system that's better for everybody. Um, so more to learn, more to practice, but I'm just trying to, I'm like synthesizing all this dope stuff I'm hearing and uh, thank you. Yeah. I, I wanna add, thank you, Baratun, that says it all, but I want to kind of take your ball and run with it slightly further. One of the most nice things I'm hearing lately, and I don't really know exactly how this is going to play out, but it's it's Jack Doris's idea of pick your own algorithms. And so, I mean, people who spend their lives, you know, in Clubhouse or in Facebook or it's, it's not that they don't wish that they did that. It's, it's like they always regret it afterwards. And so if you gave them the opportunity to pick and if you let me, uh, now I'm nicely centered. If you give people the tools to manipulate themselves. So instead of you go online and there's some algorithm manipulating you to generate revenues for somebody, you go online and you pick an algorithm that you pick to manipulate your own behavior. I want to watch you know, enlightening movies. I want to listen to inspiring authors. I want to watch hilarious comedians who actually have a social mission as well. I'm looking at you. Um, you know, it will help you do that. And I, I'm really excited and eager to hear what that turns into and how effective it becomes. But that's that's a real ray of hope to my mind. I think to that end, we ray may of also- hope. Can we just acknowledge ray of hope? I, I, I love that, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Dana. Tell- no, sure. <laughs> no I, guess, I guess building off of this, I think part of it is to recognize that power dynamics are not just between individuals and the technology companies or the technology, but they're also interpersonal in all sorts of ways. I mean, we're seeing this right now where parents are trying to, to program children's lives, right? Children are not given opportunity to ha- to make their own algorithms, to make their own decisions, to make their own choices. And so they're looking for systems to escape. And we've seen that through this whole history. You know, my childhood is one of just trying to escape the situation in my, you know, growing up environment, trying to find people that were like me, but by my terms, with my agency, by my definition. And one of the things that I constantly keep minding of, and this goes back to to Baratunde's point about listen to the people, right? Which is that I think that many of us who are in privileged positions to make choices, we want to control it. But there's also a ton of work that shows that people actually don't have those choices even when we think we give them those choices. And why is that? Because the issues of power and the issues of control actually go far beyond an individual in relationship to technology. Um, And that's where I think, you know, it's important to realize why people find pleasure through different forms of escapism. And they have a found pleasure through escapism forever. Um, And that escapism comes in the form of alcohol, that comes in the form of watching TV, that comes in the form of spending ridiculous amounts of hours on, you know, a chat platform. Um, But part of it is to recognize where that pleasure comes from and say, hey, what else have we structured within our society that leaves people where that's the point of joy? And do are we okay where that's the primary point of joy? 
how do we actually think about that? And that goes back, Esther, to your earlier points, because I do think that this is about quick fix, because I think that that's how the financial system has been set up. I think that's how the political system has been set up. And so what we're seeing is, is that the technology is mirroring a lot of those other quick fix narratives. I mean, we should be having a governance system that doesn't require a politician to start, um, you know, aiming to raise money the moment after they got elected, right? That's an unhealthy quick fix dynamic. And yet we're stuck in that. So I think we're dealing with a broader systems level issue where we're just seeing one slice of that pie. I, I totally agree. It's not just the internet, uh, but where I disagree is most of addiction is not about pleasure. It's about relief. And that's why it's so sad. But cheer us up, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it's interesting. We've reached an interesting point here where we're, you know, kind of like, like getting, you know, like all like political and fired up. And um, I want to bring Ray Ozzy, our honoree, on the stage. Maybe after all this, he doesn't want to come on the stage, but uh, uh, there he is, Ray. Hey. Welcome and congratulations. Hey. Hello. Hey. Happy to see you. Uh, it's great to be here. I, um, God, th this was a great panel to listen to. I have to say, I, I it's a little intimidating to uh, <laughs> to come into this group. Um, thanks for thanks for bringing me up here, and thanks for taking the time to do this. I I, I really appreciate it. So, Ray, I, I want to ask you. I want you maybe to look back on the promise of connectivity that you saw and did so much to invent and promote, and what what do you see now? Do you, do you find that you are as optimistic as, as you were? Or, you know, tell us a little bit about how you viewed th this as, as it evolved. Well, just you know, to be perfectly direct, when I when we were working in the in, in the era that Esther was is, was probably uh, writing about us in, um, uh, I don't think we I did not have any. Um, illusions. I did not think there would be this level of, of connection at the consumer level in my lifetime. Um, you know, I, I knew that we would have computers in every, in every home and computers on every desk. And I, my dreams were more in the restructuring of business and commerce around, um, um, you know what what would happen if you could eliminate friction um, among companies you know could you come up with new corporate entities uh, who have common economic goals by reducing friction are big companies really needed uh, anymore can they can the power of big companies um, you know can that imbalance change over time because of the nature of small companies working with one another what's gone on in the consumer realm is um, breathtaking and shocking, and for all the reasons that you folks, you know, have have laid out, and um, I'm still puzzled why people did not recognize the power of friction um, earlier, uh, you know, than 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 now. It's, you know, we've been a, we've been headstrong trying to introduce, trying to remove friction, and simple things that we do in, hu in, in, in our human nature, like uh, we have decay functions built into our relationships. Um, it's just a natural thing. And that just, that helps. It helps, you know, we have forgetfulness. We have all sorts of things that, um, that help us cope as humans and has helped society um, uh, thrive. And I hope, but I'm not optimistic. I hope that uh, tool builders um, will start to experiment with some of these things when, as as you know, as perhaps backlash or whiplash, you know, against some of the horrible things that are happening because of the centralization of of the platforms and the centralization of power around those platforms, and the fact that. The realization that, that most people who use these platforms don't manage them. They allow themselves to be sucked into them yeah. and um, be taken advantage of. So I'm, 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 I'm really not sure how to, 
how to respond to that. I'm very optimistic on the commercial side. I'm, I'm not, um, not so optimistic on the uh, political and soci societal uh, repercussions of, of what we've created on the, on the uh, communication side. Ray, you've at least, uh, you've given me a new way to view what happens when someone texts me and I don't know who it is. You know, the number is gone. I no longer have to feel bad and say, lost your number, who this? I can say this is a natural feature of my evolutionarily sophisticated human decay function. That's right. <laughs> it's a feature, not a bug. Peace out. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's it, these are really silly things, but you know, contactless address books, yes. you know, friendless, yes. they should just have decay functions. Messaging should have decay functions. Every everything, it would it would be different. It's it's different. I can't just wish this and have it happen everywhere. But uh, maybe I will choose my algorithm, you know, to be one that. Um, that yeah. everyone who has my contact decays away from me and vice versa. Do, um, do you um, think, Ray? Right. I mean, the people you, sorry, the people you linked up with on LinkedIn when you started, like everybody, and you know, now you become more discriminating. Right, right. Sorry, yeah. No problem, I, I offer an ask. Um, it feels to me like the automation that we feared that sort of robots would take over, has actually been imposed on our own behavior. You know, we're the automated ones. We're expected to operate CRMs, you know, just to live a regular life right. and manage data and react and click repeatedly at high speeds, which is something that robots are literally built to do. I'm wondering if you have, you know, extended any other thoughts on that, how you react to the idea that we are kind of working for these things as opposed to having them work for us. Well, it is, it, it absolutely is. I don't know if you, you know, how you watch other people interacting with their phones, um, but they're just immersed, absolutely immersed. And, and, and so much of it is um, just instinct and, and just reaction, just swiping or tapping, double tapping, you know, double tapping, double tapping, double tapping because of an obligation that, uh, that you've made socially that you're going to be embarrassed you're going to be embarrassed if they don't think you paid attention to them there are all these odd loops that have that have happened um and yeah it's it's created it's created within the platform and and we've had a good run of 10 years of experimentation in this platform to see how far we can go in that direction and all i hope is that some entrepreneurs um start to experiment uh, with other with other mechanisms, I said I, uh, I said this earlier on in, a, in an earlier part of the venue, but um, COVID has been the pandemic has has created a uh, discontinuity in how we live our lives and in discontinuity in business, and I think it's incumbent upon us to take advantage of that discontinuity um, in what we build and in our perspective on things as we start to travel again. Um, you know, as we go back and try to redefine what work looks like, um, and maybe now in, you know, in a, in a, there's a discontinuity in administration. There are many discontinuities that happened. I just, um, I think we should just be encouraging people to take new perspectives on social tools, organizational tools, and, and so on. Speaking of one, those perspectives. One, uh, oops, so speaking of some of those interesting perspectives, I think one of the things I learned in thinking about designing of a system is to resist the desire to design and aim for the center with whatever definition of center that is, and to look for the outliers and the people who resist the technologies, because they often teach us the most interesting aspect of the technology. And indeed, you see some of your decay function in this. It's my favorite things of watching young people where they would go out of their way to jump platforms in order to encourage decay within their social worlds. It was very confusing for people who were like, well, why don't they love our platform? I'm like, because they've decided that they're 
in the 10th grade, not the ninth grade. And they want to shift in order to force decay. It was also some things where we often like Snapchat where people are like, it's about privacy. I'm like, no, it's not actually about privacy. It's about shifting and forcing the technology to do certain work for you. So it's like, instead of actually aiming for privacy and social norms, you aim to allow the technology to decay the, the image. And then if somebody went out of their way to capture it, that made them creepy. And I think about these moments because I see this all the time, even now in, in our you know, weird COVID world, the outlier behaviors are the things that teach us the most. And yet, because we tend to look at the systems through data analytics, we tend to focus on whatever is within the curve rather than th really purposefully looking at the edges. And I think that the edges are really the key for understanding where future possibilities um, are opportunities. One, one other optimistic point. Um, as we look at AI and start to realize how biased it is, it actually shines a mirror back on us because the AI didn't get its biases by itself. It got its biases from the behavior of the people who we are mistakenly using as guides to the AI. And, you know, long story short, let's use AI to fix that rather than to mirror it. So I, I think that sort of the, the grail, the holy grail is that these technologies let us connect with each other as ourselves, whether our, our, you know, it's our building selves to help us collaborate or our social selves to help us be with each other. What Dana talked about, you know, it's creepy when they, you know, you know, uh, were exposed on that is that, you know, what made Snapchat successful is it let people be silly and not put up fake personas. And that lasted, I guess, for a while. But, but you know, and, and that's like, I think what you saw early on, what, what maybe Plato let you be and what you wanted us to be, Ray, was a, our, ourselves connected. Yep. I think that that was well said. And and again, it was not a, it was absolutely, Baratuna, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. It was not a perfect environment. We you we got to see a little taste of the dark side of um, of human nature, and, mm -hmm. and none, of the, none of these things are um, you know people use it for illegal activities and things like that. But I tend to um, I tend to try to en envision where these things could ultimately um, uh, create good outcomes, and um, I'm still optimistic about that, but there's a big overhang right, that we have to get past. Well, I wanna, I wanna thank you certainly, Ray, and you know, congratulations again, and thank my wonderful panelists and the Computer History Museum. Thank you all, good night. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>
almost anything. Building is the best form of activism and you can make a difference. Learning how to, uh, Im like, to build these companies, uh, how to uh, improve uh, the world, improve society, improve markets, uh, create uh, lots of jobs, uh, transform industries. Technology is playing a very key role in how we connect and communicate and get stuff done. And so we need to bring the human elements of trust and, and connection and empathy to these technologies and devices. At the end of the day, we're all building this technology, but it's about the humans. Humans can imagine. They can imagine a future that doesn't exist. They can imagine a product that doesn't exist. They can imagine a service. They can imagine a concept. And they can envision it from whole cloth. By dreaming of, a, of that future and then putting in motion all the resources it takes to make that future happen, that's what makes us uniquely human. It's sort of like uh, humanity at its most powerful expression. I envision a future where talent and opportunities align so that everyone can reach their full potential. Where the new normal is that normal defies definition. Ultimately, all of this technology is uh, to make our lives better as people. Uh, and uh, to make the world flourish uh, in a way that uh, we can all uh, pass on to our children, our grandchildren, and on for into the foreseeable future. My hope is that as we think about how we align our dreams for our own lives and our dreams for technology and business and align them with a dream for all of humanity. And when we contribute to that virtuous cycle, we can teach every man, woman, and nameless child to dream. They say there are two important days in your life, the day you are born and the day you find out why. There comes a point in time where we disrupt the boundaries and redefine the rules that restrict us. I aspire to develop technology that will break barriers and create a better future for people from all over the world. Thank you all for your presence here tonight. And please join us in June to celebrate CHM Class of 2021 fellow AI pioneer Raj Reddy as we explore the important theme of diversity and inclusion in our connected digital world. And with that, thanks again to Ray. Thanks for all you've done, for all you will do, and to each of you who have participated in tonight's program for your interest in and support of CHM. Ultimately, the future we want to build will depend on all of us. As we conclude this evening, I invite you to consider what will you build? How will your actions impact the world and benefit humanity? This is the question we're asking ourselves every day at CHM as we shape a better future together.